So we're glad you're here with us. Our scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 10. I'll be reading verses 1 through 18. You can follow along on the screens or on the pew Bibles that are in front of you. We read from the New English Translation. Let us hear the word of God together. I tell you the solemn truth. The one who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in some other way is a thief and robber. The one who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. The doorkeeper opens the door for him and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought all his own sheep out, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they recognize his voice. They will never follow a stranger, but will run away from him because they do not recognize the stranger's voice. Jesus told them this parable, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus said again, I tell you the solemn truth, I am the door for the sheep. All who came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I have come so that you may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand who does not, who is not a shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees a wolf coming and abandons the sheep and runs away. So the wolf attacks the sheep and scatters them. Because he is a hired hand and is not concerned about the sheep, he runs away. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not come from this sheepfold. I must bring them too, and they will listen to my voice so that there will be one flock and one shepherd. This is why the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it back again. No one takes it away from me, but I lay it down for my own free will. I have the authority to lay it down, and I have the authority to take it back again. This commandment I received from my Father. The word of God for the people of God, and the people of God said, thanks. Amen. You may be seated. One of the dilemmas of this series for me has been just this reality that God is working a powerful work in my heart. My, My personal journey through this text and through this series has been Genuinely, and I I say this not hyperbolically, but I say it has been a paradigm shifter for my relationship with God. Um, I've had kind of these periods over the course of my life where I can identify. I remember when I was 20, 21, and I was kind of doing that thing where I was trying to figure out my own path through life. And I was trying to figure out my journey. Where is God and who is God and how does God fit into the story? And I came across a book called Wild at Heart by a guy named John Eldridge. Some of you may have read it. And I read this and it was one of those things where it opened up this new perspective of who God is. And and in that moment, it kind of was a slight shift in my relationship to God. Not because God changed, but because I was more aware of a different aspect of who God is. And as I've been reading through all of the stuff in preparation for this series to truly understand, in part, that first line of the first verse of Psalms 23 that says, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing, or I shall not want, has been an unbelievable shift of my understanding of who God is. It's changed it to where I I start to see God's desire for me. And and the challenge and the dilemma in the midst of that is, is as it's changing my life, my dream, my prayer, my hope, my entire purpose as I prepare each and every week is to bring you into that same space that I have been led to myself. And I know that I don't have that power, that the Lord is who guides you, the Lord is who's going to lead you to discover more of him. But man, if I could get you all to understand this incredible and beautiful call that God has to live under his lordship, as as his shepherding leads your life, if I could help us get to that place, but sometimes, and I felt this last week, it's like one of those moments, have you ever had a movie or a TV show that you've loved, or even like maybe a, a, a reel on Instagram, or uh, even maybe a song that you've come across, and you're like, hey, you, you grab your friends, and you're like, you have to listen to this, you have to watch this, you have to look at this video, and you're watching it with them while they're watching it, and you're like looking over at them the whole time, like, are they trying to see if they're enjoying it as much as you, and like, You feel that profound disappointment when you thought it was the funniest thing or the best song or the greatest movie. And they're like, yeah, it was okay. You ever feel that? 
Well, sometimes that's the challenge whenever God begins to reveal stuff in our hearts is sometimes we want other people to be where we are, but we got to trust that God is going to lead them in that journey towards their revelation of who God is in their lives. And so I want you all to, to just begin to grasp more and more of how profoundly important it is for us to understand Jesus Christ as our shepherd, and in him we have no lack And one of the ways that we can get there together is by taking seriously the call to both memorize and meditate upon Psalms 23. To take seriously the call to engage with this text in such a way that it becomes centered in your spirit to where you no longer have to read it. Because here's what's happened, and Dallas Willard, who's one of my favorite authors, he once again, it's on the bingo card, but but he mentioned it this way. He says, "When when you begin to memorize Scripture... When you begin to allow the text to be written on your heart, it makes it to where any part of any day, at any moment, in any place, you can have a quiet time in that moment. So you could be literally sitting in the line at the grocery store, standing in the line at the grocery store, and all of a sudden the Lord's going to put on your heart, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the quiet waters. He restores my soul. Maybe it's one of those moments where you're like, not in the best space mentally, right? Somebody cut you off. If you're in Edmond and you're trying trying to drive from the east side of town to the west side of the town and that train decides that it's going to just come through on the train tracks and it's not one of those times where it just flies by, but it's one of those times where it's like, hey, we're going to just take a quick lunch. And then they just put it in park and you're stuck and your blood's boiling and you know, maybe some of you, not me, but maybe your wife is angry at you as if you're the one that drives the train. Like I said, that may be your story, not mine, but, but the truth is, in those moments, is if we allow the scripture, the word of God, to literally be penetrated into the depths of our soul, if we take the time and intentionally memorize the word, then in those moments, in any single moment, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides the quiet waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk Through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, because his rod and his staff, they comfort me. He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. He anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. And as you memorize and you meditate on that, so I encourage you, we're going to recite it here together, but I encourage you to, to take this practice seriously. To take this practice seriously. And the way that we're doing it makes it kind of where it's like bite-sized pieces. Some of you already have this locked down, and, and man, we celebrate that. For some of you, you need to work through it in the bite-sized pieces that we've gotten. So last week, we started with verse 1. This week, we're going to do verse 2 and part of verse 3, literally the very first sentence of verse 3. But if you're following along with us and just committing to memory each passage that we go through the week of, by the end of Lent and on Easter Sunday, you'll be able to recite this. And I'm telling you, if you memorize the word and meditate upon the word, it will change your life. And that's not hyperbolic. That's just the truth. So, Psalms 23. It's going to be on the screen if you'll read it with me. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen, amen, amen. So last week we started with that first verse. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And we talked about the translation differences some. And I prefer the one that actually says I, I, I shall not lack or I lack nothing. And part of that is just because there's some language kind of mixed up. When I think about want, I think it's dangerous and close to like, well, God's just a genie that I can rub on a lamp and he'll provide whatever need I have. But that's not the truth of who God is. God provides for you what you need, and what you need ultimately is him. And if that's all he gives you is himself, then it is more than enough. If he gives you his very presence in your life, then you literally will live a life without lacking anything. 
But if you look at that first verse, what I want you to know, and I want you to kind of grasp in some part, is how that is literally enough. Like we could stop the series and be like, you got it. God, who authored the heavens and the earth, the infinite, Lord Almighty, Yahweh, Jehovah Jireh, he is your shepherd. He has a relationship with you that is available to you, that is as near as any other relationship defined in the scripture, a shepherd to a sheep. God longs for that relationship with you. So we see that as part of it. And then we see that other part is, is if you live underneath that relationship with God, you truly will have all of your deepest longings satisfied. What I would also want you to know is is that is literally an evangelical tool. And when I say evangelical, please just just throw the way the world defines evangelical. I'm talking about those who proclaim the good news. Those who proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ because it's all summed up in there. I've been really kind of defining who I am and, and what my role is as the senior pastor here. And, and deep in my heart is this, is this connection to this passage is what I believe is that all of us and every single person that's outside of these walls and outside of these doors, every single person you come in contact with was created by God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And every single person that is in this world was created with both the imprint of the divine and the result of the fall in Genesis 3. That we are, by our nature, conflicted. We live in this space where we have capacity for incredible good because of God's imprint on us, but also we have this capacity for evil because of the imprint of Adam and Eve's failure in Genesis 3. And what I do believe, and this is what drives me to be a pastor at all, is I believe that all of us have this fractured piece of us, this missing part, this yearning and longing that lives inside of us. And and for all of history, humanity has daily been pursuing all sorts of other options to satisfy what we were longing for. And what I believe and what draws me back to this is that every single longing we have, every single ache that we have, every broken part of our hearts, all of them, the only solution is not working out or breathing exercises or self-help books or the better career or the better family or any. None of those things will satisfy the deepest longings of your soul, but only Jesus Christ will. That, that's, that's it. That's the gospel. It's like, okay, so what's the gospel? Tell me why you believe in Jesus. We'll be like, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Okay, I need a little more context to that. Well, here's what I believe is I'm broken. And there's a loving God who wants to have a relationship with me like a shepherd to a sheep. And what he says is as I live underneath his lordship in my life is that thing that's broken inside of me, only by his grace, only by the blood of the cross, only by the power of the empty tomb can I be made whole. That's why I believe in Jesus. So, it really is enough. Unfortunately for you, or fortunate for you, is we've got five more weeks to preach through the rest of the Psalms. And I say that because you're going to come across things where it's like, didn't we talk about this last week? Didn't Pastor Jay already preach on this? And, and there is truth to that. But one of the things that I have come to understand in my own life is, is in my world outside, well, everywhere in my world, is sometimes it helps me to be told more than once. Amen? Can I just get wives in the room? Sometimes we need to be told more than once. Amen? Thank you. Somebody knows. All of y'all have walked through that moment in your life where you're like, I didn't, you didn't tell me that. And we're like, absolutely. And then if you have cameras in your house, you're able to go back and be like, all right, well, let's, let's roll the tape. So each week it may feel a little bit similar. And, and I think the reason is and what David wants to say and what the Holy Spirit wants to say through David in our Holy Scripture here is he wants you to say, if you don't get it the first time, maybe you get it the fifth time. Even the disciples were told three different times that Jesus was going to be crucified and was going to be risen from the dead after three days. And when it all happened, they act like everything was brand new. Like, what? Huh? No, no, no. You, didn't, you never said that to me. And it's like, actually, we have it written down. There's four gospels. Sorry. No, nobody got that one. Um, but that's fine. So, 
what do we want to know from God's holy word this morning? We're just going to unpack those three, and, and we're going to be brief, but we're going to be intentional this morning. The Lord as our shepherd makes us lie down in green pastures. He leads us besides the still waters, and he restores our souls. And what I want you to hear today, friends, is with the Lord as your shepherd, you can know and experience what it means to be safe, satisfied, well-rested, and fully restored in him. Let me say that one more time. With Jesus Christ as your good shepherd, you can truly know and experience what it means to be safe, satisfied, well-rested, and fully restored. And I don't know about you, but that's what I long for. Jesus, as our good shepherd, makes us lie down in green pastures. He leads us beside still waters. Here's what I have to confess is I actually have seen sheep before, so you can stop sending me all of your information about sheep and shepherds. Thank you so much. It was a joke. Uh, I've been to fairs. I've seen them here at petting zoos. Uh, but here's what I have begun to learn about sheep is, number one, I want one. I want a plethora of sheep. I would love to have those, but we don't have the house to do so. But we would also take, if you wanted to give us a parcel of land with those sheep and a shepherd and somebody to do all the work, that would be tight. My birthday's, my birthday's April 24th. Just let me know if you plan on doing that. So, but what I have begun to discover about sheep is that they're naturally drawn to be motivated by food and sustenance and survival. And so to, to hear about a sheep who is laying down in green and luscious pastures or who is leading besides the still waters, those are images that David and the Holy Spirit want to make sure you catch of a sheep who has had every single need met. They're not hungry. They're not thirsty. They're not afraid. One of the things, and I mentioned this book last week, it's a guy named Philip Keller wrote it. It's, he was a shepherd in, in the early 20th century, and he wrote kind of his reflections on Psalms 23 through the context of his career and his life. And one of the things that he realized, and one of the things he wanted you and I to know, is that a sheep will only lay down when they are free from fear, conflict, physical bother, and hunger. And by physical bother, we're talking about like the different kind of insects and different problems they might have with things that try to eat them or take part of them. They will only sleep. They will only lay down if they're free from fear, conflict, and hunger. I think there's some truth in that for you and I as well. And I think what, what we're trying to discover in the midst of this is when the Lord is our shepherd, is we can actually live without fear without hunger, and without conflict. Travis Bruno, my brother in Christ over here, mentioned a couple weeks ago in our forum on a, through our Bible reading plan, which is through our app. And I just encourage you, if you haven't been following along, you're interested in that, come and talk to me or, or, or any of our staff can help you figure out how to do it. But he kind of mentioned these like spaces that we would call sacred spaces. These places in people's lives where if you're just there, there's something where the Lord draws you into his very love. And, people, you know, it's kind of like, where do you go to spend devotional time? Where do you go to be as close as you can to God? And, and then it just became this whole thread of, like, people who, we have a bunch of mountain people. Anybody like mountains or where you show up and it's like, well, there's the Lord. He's right here, right? Any of you more like ocean people? You want a beach? You want a bed? No few of you, y'all, are we here? Y'all, don't be timid about beaches and mountains. Thank you, Donna. Some of you, and this, is, this has been the weirdest thing, it's like mountains and beaches, and my, mine, honestly, is the lake. I love a lake, which feels like inferior in every way, right? Like, right, we're talking about beaches and mountains, and you're talking about a dirty lake? Yes. And maybe there's a whole sermon series on how the Lord takes dirty things and makes them clean. And maybe that's what the Lord has drawn me into, but we'll save that for another Sunday. But there's something about these sacred spaces. And every time I read verses 1 and 2 of Psalms 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. I think about those places. And I think genuinely about green pastures, and, and I, I know many of you probably don't frolic through green pastures or lay down in them, but I want you to at least grasp that imagery of just total and absolute peace. 
No worries in the world. No fears in the world. That's the thing that God wants for you every single day. Still waters. We know that sustenance and, and, and thirst was something that could kill many sheep. Many sheep, especially in the ancient Near East, which would have been the context of both David and Jesus, they would have known what it was like to not have water. Seasons where drought would terrify the countryside, where thousands of sheep would die, and what David is saying and what the Lord wants you to hear is you will never thirst under his lordship. And we see Jesus talk about this in John chapter 4, and he's talking to this woman at the well, and she's asking him different questions, and he's responding. He says, well, woman, will you do me a favor and get me some water? And she says, well, you don't have any pails to pick up water. Well, Jesus' response to her is like, if you would have known who it was that was talking to you, you would have asked me, and I would have given you water. And if you would have taken that water, you would never be thirsty again. Because in Jesus is living water. And that's an imagery we glance by whenever we read the Gospels. But I want you to know what he is saying is in Jesus is the total and absolute providence that we long for and lack. So we see that there's this imagery that David is using. But he moves on to verse 3 at the very beginning. Verse 3a says, he restores my soul. Our passage today was from John chapter 10, and it's Jesus telling multiple stories. It's actually two of his first seven I am statements in the gospel of John. And he says that I am the gate, and that I am the good shepherd. I am the gate, I'm the good shepherd. And he draws this contrast of those who've come before him, and the sheep don't know their voice. And actually those who've come before him were thieves, and we know that the thief comes only to kill, steal, and destroy, but Jesus has come to have life, and life in its abundancy, or life to its fullest. So Jesus is drawing this contrast, and Jesus is telling you and I that he is the good shepherd. And he gives these images. I am the good shepherd, and if I come into the pen where you are, those who are my sheep recognize my voice. And then he says this beautiful and powerful statement. Once again, it's something we can easily gloss over, but he says, I lead my sheep out of the pen. It's an important distinction. Some of you, maybe your only understanding of what it means to lead a herd anywhere is the 90s movie City Slickers 1 or 2. Some of the finest cinema the world has ever seen. <laughs> but often when you think of ranchers who are driving cattle as they're driving from behind, right? Keeping, you know, kind of moving them this way. Maybe they've kind of surrounded them. But Jesus leads. The shepherds, especially in the ancient Near East, they would lead the sheep. They would be in front of the sheep. And I want you to hear that, especially if you're in a season where you're really struggling or doubting is that Jesus isn't waiting for you behind to move forward. He's showing you the pathway to move ahead. That's why the book of Hebrews, like one of the greatest stories from the book of Hebrews, one of the greatest truths from the book of Hebrews is that we don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize, but he has been tested in every single way. He suffered in every single way. And because he endured it, you can too, because he's gone ahead of us, just like the, the Israelites in the Exodus, he leads us today in the same way with a cloud of smoke or a cloud of fire. But maybe it's not as outward like that. But what we know is by his life, death, and resurrection, he showed us the path to follow in his righteousness. He restores our soul. This is the last thing I want you to hear today. I want you to know that in Jesus is the restoration of your souls. The only possible answer to the problem of our existence is Jesus Christ. And my prayer, my hope as we read this text is we might grow to realize that he, his stripes, his suffering, and his willing offer is what restores your soul. There's this, this it almost feels like Jesus just kind of tosses it in there at the very end. And that's what, I read 18 verses this morning, and I know some of you in the room are like, dude, can we get back to like two or three verses on Sunday mornings. Maybe we would get out of here a little bit earlier. Uh, but I couldn't stop. It's like, where am I supposed to stop? Because there at the end of John chapter 10, verse 1 through 18, there at the end he has this incredibly important and, and, and powerful statement. He says, he says, you don't take my life. I lay it down 
on my own account, and I have the ability to take it back up again. And for once again, this is one of those things, maybe we just glance by, maybe it's in our minds not something that Jesus was really trying to make a point of, but I don't want us to miss the fact that the God of all creation came in the flesh and willingly endured hell so that you could have your souls restored by his grace and love. Willingly, he laid down his life. And he tells Pilate, I'm jumping ahead, Good Friday is like four or five weeks away, but he tells Pilate in this moment, he says, if I wanted to, I could call down the angel armies. But but I'm going to the cross. Why? Why? So that you might share in his death and resurrection. That through the blood of the cross and the victory of the empty tomb, deep down inside of you, these aches and hurts and longings, all of those things can be satisfied. That your very inward being can find its restoration, satisfaction, completeness, and wholeness in the healing that comes from Jesus Christ and him alone. So what do we do? I think we listen and we learn to know his voice. We learn to recognize his voice. Draw near to God regularly through scripture, through prayer, through fasting, through solitude, through coming to church, through worshiping. Draw near to God regularly and you will not ever be misled by a sheep or a shepherd that is not your shepherd. Because you will know his voice. Know his sacrifice. Inwardly dwell in your hearts on the truth of God's power and his love by making all things new through the cross on Calvary. And the last thing, I want you to know whether, like I, I'm not a, I'm not, I don't want to ever be this place or be this pastor or be this kind of leader or church where, and this is part of why we're very okay with not being okay, right? Like, like sometimes our life feels like our order of worship was today, right? Like, a microphone didn't work, the videos were out of order, and this and this. Sometimes life feels like that, and we want to be okay not being okay, right? Um, and so I, I, I understand that many of you have come into here today. Kyle, make your, get on up here, man, so I don't get mad at you. <laughs> um, like, I know that there are people who are showing up just because they're hoping that one week there's going to be a breakthrough. That one week, like, feeling distant, all of a sudden we're going to be felt drawn near. Um, And what I want you to hear is that the presence of the shepherd calms the sheep. The presence of the shepherd calms the sheep. And I know sometimes it feels like a platitude, like, all right, toss that up in the air and see if it's, you know, what, what does it materialize into? But I know when I think about Paul and he's like, I've got this problem, you know, and I can't get rid of it. I prayed that God, like Paul healed dead people, brought them back to life. And he's saying, I have this problem and I've been praying to God regularly that he would remove it from me. And all he's responding to is my grace is sufficient. That his power is made fuller in our weakness. Like sometimes when you think about the good shepherd, it's not like the good shepherd's going to come in and be like, all right, poof, everything's fixed. What he's going to let you know is like in my presence, you're going to be okay. So we draw to him, we listen for his voice because the presence of the shepherd calms the sheep. The last thing I want you to know, and, and I'm so like... I know some of you are already ready for the next thing and and feel free to move on, but I I can't leave without sharing this word. I was reading a devotion uh, that I've been reading over Lent called Where Shepherds Watch Their Flock. I talked about it last week by Dr. Timothy Laniak. And it's a powerful devotion, 40 days up through, through Easter. One of the stories he tells about how sheep know their shepherd's voice, but he's also telling it in the context of shepherds pursuing the sheep that got lost or got away. And he tells the story of this this woman shepherd who had her flock and then she started to notice that one of her sheep was gone. And as every good shepherd would do, is when one walks away, the shepherd turned the whole hillside up and down to find the lost sheep. 
months go by and everybody's kind of given up hope. Like it must have been a wolf that got it or a coyote or maybe it just got lost enough, got swept in a stream or, or whatever happened, but that sheep is gone. But she persisted and she would ask. Anytime she'd come up with her herd up and another flock of sheep would come in and they would just sit there and she would say, hey, just a heads up, like have you seen? This is what the sheep looks like. It's about this tall. It looks like a sheep. Have you ever heard of it? And uh, he tells the story about this one time, three months later, and she is walking up and she sees this, you know, herd of sheep and she begins to talk to the shepherd. She says, hey, and they mark them just in case you didn't know, like they paint them sometimes or they do different things to mark them. And she says, hey, have you seen my sheep? Three months later, and she could look through the flock and she saw this one sheep raise its head up because that sheep knew the voice of its shepherd. And so she grabbed that sheep and she threw a party. Like when Jesus was telling these parables, they weren't coming from thin air. Like these are stories of legitimate life. And so I know somebody in here or somebody in your life is a sheep that's been lost. And, and, and let me say this in two parts. Like I said, I, I can't not say this today. It's for some of you, you have a child or a sibling you have a family member, uh, a brother or a sister, and, and they've been the lost sheep for like 50 years or 30 years or 20 years. And every part of you has given up the pursuit. And I just want you to know that, that God rewards persistence. And so it's time to take the search up again. And for some of you in this room, as you're the sheep that has wandered, and I want you to know that your loving Father will not stop searching for you. And that's the good news of the gospel. Because the Lord is your shepherd. He knows you more than you know yourself. And he is pursuing you because he wants you to live under the safety and the providence of his shepherding.